Good afternoon, everyone. As Walter said, I am James Fallows from the Atlantic Monthly. Like everyone else here, I share the great honor of having a President Bill Clinton come join us. Unlike any of the rest of you, I have a particular challenge. The interviewer of Bill Clinton faces a basic choice. One can say, you know, what do you know that's interesting? Or what's new and what do you care? We can all sit back for the next hour. Or <laughs> we could go that way. If one were dutiful enough or enough of a dreamer, one could try to impose a theme on the discussion. And I am dutiful enough and will try to be enough of a dreamer to try this ladder. And the way I'm going to try to get the president to go along with me is by suggesting why he is uniquely in the world positioned to discuss the themes we have in mind. And this is actually true. And so I'm going to lay out the three themes I hope we'll be able to, to get to. They're ones that the President Clinton has gone into in a way that nobody else on earth actually has. And they are the following global concerns and issues and challenges, which he's been addressing largely under the auspices of his Clinton Foundation and the Clinton Global Initiative. What is unique about his position here is not simply is he the second youngest man ever to leave the presidency, he is the youngest person ever to not be president and know he could not run again. <laughs> uh, Teddy Rose. Teddy Roosevelt, who was 50 when he left the presidency, could and did run again. Bill Clinton, who was 54, has, we hope, many, many years ahead of him to have a huge impact on the world, which he's already, already begun to have through his foundation. Second, we'd like to talk about some domestic political concerns and issues and challenges where his standing to speak is obvious in many ways. But a particular aspect of his standing to speak is to being the first Democrat since FDR to win and serve two terms, two full terms, and save for those pesky constitutional amendments based on the polls, he would have been the first to win and serve three terms. So we'll ask about his political expertise. And then finally, I'd like to get some of his views of particular issues between the United States and the rest of the world which has been an ongoing leitmotif at this conference. Here his standing is not simply is the, the American who is best like in the rest of the world, according to recent polls, but according to polls I saw this morning, he is the most popular man on earth. <laughs> is, is that enough? Yes, it's true. Now, now Slim Pickens. <laughs> okay, well, Slim Pickens out there. You so must not have given them the right choices. <laughs> So, you know, it may be like the people's sexiest man alive. This may be transitory, but at least for this moment, you see the most popular person on the world is, is here, here with us. So that's, that's the, the goal. And then we'll have time for some questions, depending on how much of his expertise the president shares with us. So that, that's the ambition. So <laughs> that's the nicest way of telling me to not talk too much. I really. I've, I, I've been in this situation before. <laughs> so. So uh, let's start with, with the, the, the global perspective. Since leaving office, uh, you've poured a lot of, I remember I interviewed you four years ago in circumstances like this, when you said your priorities were to build your foundation, to write your book, and to begin you know, working on some of these long-term global initiatives. You've been doing a lot of work in AIDS and other health issues and religious and ethnic conciliation, increasingly in climate change issues. I wonder if you tell us which of these issues look different to you now from when you were president, in, sense, in the sense of their urgency, their solvability, their new nature, and if also, second, you talk in particular about the climate change issue, issue which I know has been more and more on your mind. Well, <clears throat> first let me say, um, I, I will try to be brief about both of these, but I, I want to say both the AIDS and climate change issues look somewhat different to me. Uh, when I was in, in my second term, in my first term, America still had, we thought, the biggest AIDS problem. And we spent all of our time trying to turn it around and were largely successful in doing so. In my second term, we were able to like triple America's overseas uh, AIDS budget. And we devoted a lot of time to helping countries start their programs. But I don't think I remotely understood uh, the scope of the challenge or the necessary systematic challenges to meet it. When I left office, actually, uh, I have to give President Bush credit for this. He got a lot more money out of the Republican Congress for AIDS than I could have. And I think he deserves credit for it. And uh, they did set, the, uh, set up their own program, PEPFAR. I would have preferred to see more of the money going to the Global Fund on AIDS, TB, and malaria. But we work with the Bush program in many of the countries in which I work. 
What I know now about this is what I know about a lot of other things in developing countries and in poorer communities in America, which is that it's not just a money problem. Intelligence and ability and effort are largely evenly distributed throughout the world, but organizations and systematic capacity aren't. So, and, and if you don't have the requisite level of organization and systematic capacity, very often the money will come a cropper. It won't be as effective, no matter whether it's delivered in a unilateral fashion like PEPFAR and a multilateral fashion like the Global Fund. So what I tried to do there was to organize the first the generic drug markets and the testing markets to get the prices down to the lowest levels in the world, and then to organize the countries involved so that if something happened to me or our foundation, they would still have a system that would work for them, not only in dealing with AIDS, but in other health problems as well. And I get that in a way I didn't when I was president. Uh, with regard to climate change, you know, we, um, I was just going back. I, the best thing about the 2005 energy bill that the Congress passed and President Bush signed, in my opinion, and I didn't like a lot of it, but they did give a 25% tax credit for the purchase of clean energy technologies. So I went back and read the uh, speech I gave in 1997 advocating that. And it was given at the National Geographic Building, and Al Gore w went there. We hyped the living daylights out of it to the press. And, you know, I, I advocated this and, and talked about, going on, is it on now? I talked about the problems of global warming, and we were running up to Kyoto then. And I, I thought it was a pretty good speech. <laughs> and. <laughs> It was a total dud. I mean, nobody covered it even. It elicited a giant yawn from the press and the American public. And it, it was significant in only one respect. I told Duke Gingrich once that I thought the signal political achievement of my second term was that I finally found a tax cut he would oppose. <laughs> because, uh, you know, big oil and big coal were against cutting taxes to buy solar power and wind power and you know, all that other stuff. It was interesting. So, but the reason was oil was low and the, the core of people who understood this was smaller. So what I've learned about that since I got out is t two things. One is it's a lot worse than I thought it was when I was in. And I, I believe, you know, all the evidence shows that. There's a new, st uh, there's a new story in the paper today where a lot of... Uh, Western timber and uh, fire experts are saying that the increased wildfires in the West are primarily due to rapidly warming temperatures here in the summertime. A lot worse than I thought. The second thing I've learned is I've only confirmed my conviction that looking at this as a threat, and you're, I don't know if you remember this, but after we negotiated the Kyoto treatment, Treaty, I think the, it's the only thing the Senate ever voted unanimously on the whole time I was president. They voted like 85 or 90 to nothing to reject it before I even presented it to them because they believed it would wreck the American economy. And compare our economy to Britain's where they're going to meet their Kyoto targets. We have similar economic systems, similar unemployment rates, but wages are stagnant in America and poverty is rising and inequality is rising. They have rising wages and declining inequality, and this, I believe the most important reason is, I'd like to tell you it's because Tony Blair has economic policies more like mine, but the truth is, I think the most important reason is they took climate change seriously, and because they did, they've created hundreds of thousands of new jobs in new areas by going for a clean energy future. And I feel more strongly about that than I ever did. The third thing I've learned that we don't have time to talk about unless somebody asks about it is that uh, uh, no, about the climate change. This is very important. Is I had, uh, I was reading a book the other day by a guy just bashing the living hell out of me about saying that he was certain the CIA briefed me.